In the previous video, we have introduced a framework to include latent variables into choice models. We provide now a step-by-step -step derivation of the likelihood function that is associated with this framework. On this picture, on the left we have the choice model that we have introduced first, and on the right we have these latent variable model that we have included as an extension of the factor analysis. So now what I will do, I will consider each of these relations that are illustrated in the picture and discuss the corresponding equation. Okay, so we will discuss each equation separately and then we will put everything together to have a model and a likelihood function because we have measurements. Let's start by the structural equation for the latent variables. So I will denote the latent variables x star and this is associated with individual n. This latent variable depends on explanatory variables. So this is a function of explanatory variables that I denote by xn. And this relationship can be parameterized, and I call lambda the parameters. So these are unknown parameters that will be estimated from data. And then I have an error term, which I call here wn, which is associated with the latent variable. So a typical example would be simply linear function. So in this case, I can say the latent variable vector is a linear combination of a list of explanatory variables plus an error term which is normally distributed with mean zero and a variance covariance matrix sigma omega. Okay, so this is the first equation. This is the structural equation for the latent variables. Let's move to the structural equation for the choice model. Well, we, we know about it already. So we have un, which is the utility, the vector of utility. And here we say that it's the combination of a deterministic part that depends on xn, which are the explanatory variables but also of x star n, which are the latent variables. The latent variables will explain the utility function. And here we have un. Again, we have parameters to estimate, so let's call them beta, like we usually do. And we have an error term, epsilon n. So a typical example would be to have a linear specification. So I would have first a term that involves the classical observed variable associated with coefficients. And then I have another set of coefficients, let's say, let's say that they are k coefficients for the first part. So I start a second set of coefficients here associated with the latent variables and an error term. A typical assumption for the error term, as you know, is that it's extreme value distributed with mean zero and scale parameter mu. Here, the only difference with what we did before is that now we have the latent variables that are used as explanatory variables for the utility, although they are latent. Let's now look at the measurement equations. So now we need to relate the latent variables the perceptions, the attitudes, with the indicators that people report when we expose them to these statements that we have introduced using the psychometrics. And this is interesting because we have a latent variable that we assume is some sort of continuous variable and indicators which are discrete. So we will do two things. We will do this in two stages. The first stage will account for the measurement errors that we already discussed about. And the second stage will project these, va these variables into a discrete space, which is associated with the indicators. For the measurement errors, the idea is, the, it's, is to say that, well, a latent variable will generate some sort of continuous indicator, which is a function of potentially several latent variables. 
So m is the model, it's a function of the latent variables, and alpha is a set of unknown parameters that have to be estimated from data. And I have an error term. So I can assume that the model is linear as an example. So this would be something like alpha i, which is the intercept plus sum over k, alpha i k, x k star, plus xi i n, and I can assume that xi i n is distributed as a normal with mean zero and variance covariance matrix sigma of xi. What do we do here? We say, well, in front of each statement, the respondent has some sort of level of agreement that we consider continuous, but which is latent as well. This is why I put a star, I star, it's latent. This is not something that is reported. And this level of agreement to the statement depends on several aspects of the perceptions and attitudes. So what does it mean? It means that for a given statement, there may be several variables, latent variables, that influence the level of agreement of this statement. This is why I write this equation. So I star would be the latent level of agreement of the individual to the statement corresponding to question I. And this is the function of potentially several latent variables. Okay, my attitudes towards the environment, maybe my perception of the public transportation and so on. Okay, so this is the first stage to combine several latent variables into the level of agreement and take into account the measurement errors. So I like to call this latent quantity a continuous indicator. So it's basically what I call the level of agreement in a continuous way. But of course, this is not what people report. I have asked them to report on a scale from one to five. So the second stage, I have to translate this continuous indicator into a discrete indicator. And the idea is the following. I will assume that if I star, the continuous indicator, is below some threshold to one, then people will respond one, which is I strongly disagree. So when the level of agreement is below to one, I strongly disagree. When my level of agreement is between to one and to two, then I will just disagree. If it happens to be between to two and to three, two thresholds, I'm neutral, and so on. So between to three and to four, I agree, and above to four, I strongly agree. But I star is a random variable. So we have to relate this random variable with a probability to respond one, two, three, four, or five. So let's look at the distribution of this variable in order to understand how this works. In this picture, on the y-axis, we have this I star, which is, as I mentioned, the level of agreement that the individual has with respect to statement I. And as we assume, this is a normal distribution. Because we have an intercept, the mean is not necessarily at zero, as represented in this picture. Now, in order to translate this into discrete indicators, we have introduced thresholds. So we call them to one, to two, to three, and to four. So what I said is that if the value of the indicator is below to one, I would strongly disagree. Between to one and to two, I disagree. To two, to three, I'm neutral. To three, to four, I agree. And beyond to four, I strongly agree. Now my measurement equation needs to calculate the probability that the individual will respond a specific value given the level of agreement. So let's take, for example, the neutral response. What is the probability that the individual responds I'm neutral to this statement? Well, this is the probability that the I star is between to two and to three. And this probability is calculated as the area under the curve, right? So this is this area. So this is how I will 
define the measurement equation. I will say that the probability that the individual is responding I'm neutral to statement i, it is the probability that the value of i star, the level of agreement towards statement i, is between tau 2 and tau 3. I have assumed the distribution for i star, it's a normal distribution, so I can calculate this integral. I can now complete the description of the measurement equation. So the probability that i n, i n being the indicator that I observe, is equal to, let's say, 1. Well, this is equal to the probability that i star n, that we have defined before, is less or equal to tau 1. And by the way, the threshold tau is also a parameter that I will have to estimate from data. I'll come back to this when we will talk about the likelihood function. Now, what is the probability that the individual responds, responds to? This is equal to the probability that i star is between tau 1 and tau 2. which I can write as the probability that i star is less or equal than tau 2 minus the probability that i star is less or equal than tau 1. And why do I write it as such? It's because this probability is given by the CDF evaluated at tau 2, and this is the CDF evaluated at tau 1. And we can continue like this for all the other indicators. Good, so this is the measurement equation for the psychometric indicators. Then we have the measurement equation for the choice. This is something that we know well. So the probability that the choice indicator is equal to 1, so this is the probability that individual n chooses alternative i, is equal to the probability that the utility associated with alternative i is greater or equal than the utility associated with any other alternative in the choice set. So there is nothing new here, this is the classical random utility assumption. The choice that is observed is associated with the alternative that has the largest utility. If we want to estimate these hybrid choice models, we need to write a likelihood function. And what is the likelihood? Well, it's the combination for each individual of the probability given by the model that the dependent variables are indeed generated. So in the case of the choice models, we were calculating the probability given by the model, then the observed choice was generated. And we calculated this for each individual, calculated the log, and did the sum. So here, in the context of these hybrid choice models, I have to calculate the joint probability that individual n chooses alternative i, and respond to all these indicators that I have observed. So I have to put everything into the same likelihood function. Okay? So the probability that I observe all the dependent variables, the choice, and all the indicators. We have introduced in the framework several error terms, and for the sake of simplicity, these three error terms that have been introduced in the framework are supposed to be independent. So this is the error term for the structural equation of the choice model, the error term for the structural equation of the latent variable model, and the error term for the measurement equation of the latent variable model. So what is the probability that individual n chooses alternative i n as given by the models. Well, let's first write it conditional on the latent variable. So let's assume that we know the value or the values of the latent variables. Then the probability to be chosen is simply the choice model that we can calculate as a function of the observed variables and the latent variable. And this choice model is a function of the beta, which are the parameters of the structural equation, and the mu parameter, which is the parameter of the measurement equation. 
Well, we know that if we use a logit model, the mu parameter is not identified and will have to be normalized to one. Now, what is the probability to predict the vector of indicators? Well, again, we use the measurement equations that provide us with this probability that i n is the vector of indicators, which is a function of the observed variables and the latent variable. And then we get several sets of parameters. Alpha, which is from the measurement equation for the continuous indicator. Tau, the thresholds. And the variance-covariance matrix of the Xi error term. Okay, so if we know the latent variables, the likelihood function is characterized by the measurement equations that we have introduced. But we don't know the latent variables. Okay, but we know how to deal with it. It's a random variable. Let's integrate it out. In the same way that we did with mixtures of logit. We had a variable which was distributed. We could write a model conditional to its value. And then we integrated this out. We do the same here. So what you have here is, on the one hand, the measurement equation for the choice model that we have introduced in the previous slide, conditional on the latent variable. We have the measurement equations for the indicators, again, conditional on the latent variable. And then we have to integrate this over all possible values of x star. And how do we get the possible values of x star? Well, this is given by the structural equations that we have introduced for the latent variable. And these structural equations provide us with the distribution of x star as a function of the explanatory variables and the additional parameters that we have introduced, lambda and sigma omega. So if we put all of this together, what we obtain is the likelihood function, which is somehow the probability to observe the choice and the indicators jointly, conditional to the variables that you observe, the independent variable, and all these parameters. We have beta and mu from the choice model, lambda and sigma omega that comes from the structural equations of the latent variable, and here I have the parameters that comes from the measurement equation of the latent variable. On purpose, I have omitted to write explicitly the structural equation for the choice model, because you know by heart what it is, right? So this is embedded into the probability of i given x, which can be a logit model or whatever you like. And now you can identify the parameters using maximum likelihood estimation. It consists in maximizing over all these parameters the sum over all individual in the sample of the log of this likelihood function. And I refer you to the PhD thesis of John Walker to get more information and more details about the specification. Latent variables can be indirectly measured using indicators. We have introduced a framework that allows to include latent variables into choice models. And similarly to what we did with the choice, we derived structural and measurement equations for the indicators. And finally, we have put everything together and we have written the likelihood function associated with this framework. In the next video, I will illustrate the framework, which is quite theoretical, using a concrete case study.